Hello, this is Sarah Sladen, Director of the Youth Economic Opportunities Network at Making Sense International. The YEO Network is a community of professionals preparing youth to learn, earn, and thrive in a changing world of work. The network's goal is to improve members' ability to design, develop, fund, and implement evidence-based, innovative, and scalable youth economic opportunities programs that improve outcomes for young people globally. Our activities include the annual Global Youth Economic Opportunities Summit, the YouthEconomicOpportunities.org Learning Hub, and year-round targeted meetings and virtual learning events. Thank you again for joining today's webinar, co-hosted by the Global Apprenticeship Network, GAN, General Electric Healthcare Solutions, ADECO, and Making Sense International. We are very excited to have participants joining us from around the world for this webinar. Today we have 175 people registered from 43 countries. On behalf of the YEO Network and Making Sense, I want to thank GAN, GE, ADECO for offering to co-host this event with us and for sharing your insights and expertise today. Participants in the webinar, we welcome your questions and contributions throughout this virtual learning event. Please write them in the chat box that's located at the bottom of your screen. And please also remember to mute your microphone so as not to interrupt the presentation. We also welcome your tweeting and Facebook posts on key points you take away from this event using the hashtag GYEO. Our first speaker today is Shay Gopal, founder and executive director of GAN. With over 20 years of experience in the UN system with the ILO, UN, and WHO, Shay led the ILO study that resulted in the development of GAN, worked at the senior levels in area of youth employment, strategic planning, human resources, external relations management, and public and private partnerships. She is recognized as an IZA fellow. She's a member of the G20, B20 Employment and Education Task Force, and an international gender champion. She has worked in the public and private sectors in Mauritius, Gabon, Morocco, the US, and Switzerland. Our second speaker today is Neha Singh, Senior Manager Strategy and Operations at uh, ADECO, at GE. Excuse me. Uh, Neha, Neha is stepping in for Marut Setia as he was un unfortunately unable to join us today. Neha leads the strategy and operations for GE's healthcare solution initiative across Africa, South Asia, and ASEAN. Having joined GE in 2014 as one of the founding members of the education team, she has been instrumental in the development of the skilling initiative that aims to train aspiring and existing healthcare professionals to deliver better health outcomes for patients globally. This education solutions initiative increased to as many as 40 plus institutions across these developing countries with a target to train 100,000 healthcare professionals by 2020. Neha holds a postgraduate diploma in management from the Indian Institute of Management and a bachelor's in technology from the National Institute of Technology. Our third speaker today is Tyra Hillis Tudor, SVP for Corporate Development at ADECO Group North America. Tyra is in charge of mergers and acquisitions, communications, community and public affairs, corporate social responsibility, and thought leadership for the ADECO Group in North America. The ADECO Group is the world's leading HR solutions partner, providing 700,000 people in permanent and flexible employment every day. Since 2016, Tyra has been instrumental in leading work-based learning initiatives with an emphasis on apprenticeships in the USA and in conjunction with the ADECO Group's global mission to increase the number of apprenticeships around the world. Tyra spent 13 years working publicly traded staffing firm MPS Group prior to joining the ADECO Group in January 2010 after the merger with the MPS Group. And finally, our moderator for today's event is Christy Olenek, Vice President for Technical Services at Making Sense International. In her 25-year career, Christy has designed, implemented, and evaluated holistic youth programs for multiple donors, local governments, and private foundations in the U.S. and internationally. As Vice President of Technical Services, she's responsible for technical leadership, service delivery, business development, and strategy around positive youth development programming. Christy also serves as Making Sense's Project Director for the USAID-funded Youth Power Evidence and Evaluation, IDIQ. She is passionate about providing opportunities for youth success and for building the capacity of the systems around them. And in fact, she's learned a lot about youth development from her teenage daughter. With that, I'll turn it over to Christy to introduce the topic of the webinar and open up today's presentation. And thank you again to everyone for joining us. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. I appreciate the introduction, and it's good to be with everybody today. Uh, I'm excited to serve as moderator of this webinar focused on redefining work-based learning in a changing world of work. Making Sense has been working on reducing barriers to youth employment for almost 20 years. Uh, we approach this work in a number of different ways by providing capacity building, research, and strategic consulting in areas like entrepreneurship, financial inclusion, and workforce development. Some of you have probably already heard me talk about a research study 
that we completed last year, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, where we mapped out a demand-driven training for youth employment framework based on the best practices of 10 demand-driven training organizations. From that framework, we created the Demand-Driven Training for Youth Employment Toolkit. The toolkit is designed to help bridge the gap between youth skills and employer needs by bringing forward detailed descriptions and examples of demand-driven training, along with tools and resources that can be used by youth employment training providers to better align with the labor market. One of the seven modules of the toolkit is called Implementing Work-Based Learning. And we talk about internships, apprenticeships, job shadowing, and other types of real-world training that get youth the experience they need in the workplace to learn both technical skills and soft skills. There are also benefits to employers who get the chance to observe youth in work-based learning experiences to see how well they perform before they hire. So I'm really excited that we have such an interesting lineup of speakers today to talk about the topic of work-based learning. And without further ado, I'll pass it on to Shay to get us started. Shay? Good afternoon. Good morning. Thank you, Sarah and Christy. I appreciate the introduction, and it's great speaking with all of you today. So the GAN was started in late 2013. And it's important to understand that at that time, the um, economic situation was not getting better for youth. And apprenticeships was sort of thought of as a silver bullet or one of the few solutions, particularly around the crisis, the youth unemployment crisis, but also more and more the skills mismatch. So in countries with high apprenticeship programs, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, we find that the youth unemployment is low, but also there is a match between the skills that employers need with the talent that they're finding. Apprenticeships, there is an L20 and a B20 definition, but basically it's about combining earning and learning. There is a structured training, and there is a stipend or a salary. Now, we have to be very careful. There are many different terms around the whole idea of work-based training. There is also internships, traineeships, learnerships, many different definitions. But apprenticeships are particularly really good in finding a good educational background and also giving opportunities for youth. It matches the training, matches what a company or industry needs. And what's very interesting, particularly during this period of AI, that they are changing with the new technologies, the work practices, the market dynamics. It's changing daily. And the curriculum is often reflected what the employers want and what the market needs. It links classroom to workplace learning, equips apprenticeships with core skills, which we're hearing are key to employers, problem solving, teamwork, communications. It offers income, and most importantly, it gives job experience for young people. As we move, why did we set up the coalition? Because as you know, even today, 71 million young people are unemployed, and that's equivalent to the whole population of France. 2 million people are unemployed, 200 million people are unemployed, that's like Brazil. And then worst are the needs, not in education, not in employment, not in training, with over 621 million. So how do we do it? We're a public-private partnership, most importantly, employer-driven. We're an outcome of the G20, the B20, L20. We were launched, and we're now an independent Swiss NGO. And we're trying to ensure skills for business and jobs for youth. Now, the GAN principles are really looking at, when our members join, we're looking at youth unemployment as one of the biggest social problems today. And the skills mismatch, which is ironic, despite all this youth unemployment, 40% of the employers are saying they cannot find the talent they need. When the GAN gets members, they commit, advocate, share, facilitate. Advocating for work readiness programs, and this could be in some countries 
in the beginning, internships or traineeships, and eventually building uh, apprenticeship systems so they can have a full-fledged system, something like the Swiss or German model. We facilitate multi-stakeholder dialogue, and that's at the local level where we set up all these GAN national networks. We share best practices both at the country level, but also at the company level, and we get companies to commit. What have we achieved? We now have some 217 GAN member companies through all our national networks. We have 11 national networks, and you're all invited on the 13th of June to Brussels in Belgium, where we'll be launching our next, next GAN national network. And we've had advocacy events, best practices, and we set up toolkits. The 9,382,712 opportunities for youth are not all apprenticeships. These are commitments by our global companies to help young people with onboarding, training them, giving them internships, traineeships, learnerships, and employment. So it's really a lot of different opportunities for youth. So where are we? If you look at the, our global footprint, we started with our first national network at the G20 in Turkey. Then we moved on to Indonesia, Spain. We are in developing countries, developed countries, and very much so in emerging markets. In fact, I was very surprised that we would today be in the US, but there's a huge demand in developed countries for also looking at apprenticeship programs. And uh, many different countries do not have the educational system nor the background. And they're looking at Switzerland, Germany, to set up these systems. So also, we have in very much needed countries such as Kenya, Tanzania, and Malawi, with the assistance of the MasterCard Foundation and also the US Department of Labor, we're setting up best practices, toolkits, and sometimes just a framework in order to set up apprenticeship programs. Throughout the world, we have now 40 employers federations that are asking us to set up networks because they see getting the word out there educating employers, but also governments, countries, youth, parents. It's very important that we try to change that stigma, which is often around apprenticeships. It's often thought of a second class education and not the same as a university education. And so our, employ our employers, federations, and companies are now leading in these um, national networks that we have. I also wanted to very quickly go over the Swiss system. You hear a lot about it, and it is really what we call the gold standard. And so it is why it's because the labor market, it's labor market oriented. It's very much looking at what is needed in the country. It's also considered a very popular career path. We have many examples of the CEO of UBS and others who have started their careers as apprentices. It's public and private, so you have the federal government, the states, or what you might call the cantons, plus the private sector all adding up and giving resources to make sure the Swiss system works. It's a dual track, so it's both vocational training and work-based learning. And lastly, what's most important is when you start an apprenticeship in Switzerland, you can do a three-year, a two-year apprenticeship, and you can easily move into a bachelor's degree program. So the career path is very much a positive one. We um, have published, along with the Swiss American Chamber of Commerce, Accenture, and ETH in Zurich, a document which you can get online, which is called Jobs Now. It talks about the Swiss model of apprenticeships, in particularly trying to fight the stigma, trying to prepare young people in this age of AI, robotics, and automation. It talks about also the importance of getting the buy-in of HR directors and others in uh, educating them around the return on investment. Now, 
This document shows you seven U.S. governors that are interested in apprenticeships, 10 CEOs in Switzerland that started their careers as apprenticeships, apprentices. And then the last part is all about experiences of Swiss companies setting up apprenticeships in the U.S. and the complications along with it. It is complicated. It is not easy. It takes time. You need to get the right partners. You need to be able to link to the, uh, in the case of the U.S., the community colleges. So it's extremely, it's not an easy thing to start up, but once it's up and running and you have it in certain sectors and industries, it's much easier for the second group of companies to start apprenticeships. But as we know it's successful and as we know that it works, we see that many countries are coming to Switzerland and Germany and really visiting the different industries to find out how do you set up a system and also how do you um, um, really sustain it. One of the last things that I'm going to talk about is while we're looking at apprenticeships, and we've been in this now almost for five years, we find that we talked about youth in the beginning, and now we're seeing mid-age career people needing retraining. So we see part-time apprenticeships within companies, pre-apprenticeship programs for refugees, often for disadvantaged youth. We also see that the three-year, four-year apprenticeships are sometimes in the IT sector for six months. We see this idea of new-collar jobs, which are basically university degree plus two, and this is particularly important in the IT sector. We see new industries, healthcare, IT, business engineering. It's just not blue collar jobs or the car industry or construction. It's really diversifying into many different industries. It's e-apprenticeships, but we are saying, Look at all these different models, but you must make it local. You must make it adapt to your country. And you must also be looking in many countries at the informal economy. Lastly, skills versus degrees. We see companies are looking for young people with the competencies and skills and not necessarily just a degree. We are also looking at SMEs, and we're finding it's extremely important that we keep it simple. Now. The GAN now has, um, we've embarked on our 2020 challenge, 20 million opportunities for youth, 20 GAN national networks, and 20 GAN board members with a budget of $20 million by 2020. We know this is a huge challenge, but with people like you who are listening on, we know there's an interest. We know that there are lots of countries out there. Even starting to advocate and speak about it is important for us. So I'll stop there and thank you, and I look forward to all your questions. Thank you so much, Shay. We really appreciate it. Um, very interesting uh, start to the discussion. Now I'd like to pass it to Neha from GE Healthcare. Neha, are you you ready? Hi. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Shay, for such a wonderful presentation. I think it was a lot of insights on why work-based learning is so important. And while Shay discussed, you know, the Swiss model and how it works for the developed uh, markets, I'm going to trust, you know, transform you all to developing market scenario and the case we are discussing today is India. Uh, she mentioned that, you know, there are newer industries, not just the blue collar ones, uh, which are adapting to these new techniques of work based learning or internships as we call it here. So I'm going to talk about an India model where we have tried to bridge the gap skill gap mm -hmm. in the healthcare industry through a very comprehensive program and internships play a huge role in that. So if I have to talk about the problems that, you know, why we should even think about skilling or skill development in the uh, developing countries like India, there are three key issues that mar these markets. The first and foremost is the education opportunities. We have more than 20 million high school graduates who do not enroll for any higher studies in India. And 60% of those are women. Amongst those who have, who have graduated, in the young adult group of 15 to 24 years of age, we have more than 20% unemployment rate. Even those who are employed, only 7% end up joining the organized sector. The government realizes this, and in the last five years, we've had major impetus on skills or vocation building vis-a-vis -a, -vis a degree or a diploma program, which takes you know two to four years of time, and 
these kids usually coming from vulnerable sections of the society or economically weaker backgrounds they want to start earning early they want to you know join the family and start earning by the month so those are some of the key um, uh, reasons if you will that we don't see a lot of these kids joining an organized program or a white collar job the on the other side is the healthcare sector according to some reports we have as many as 65 million in the skill, in the demand supply gap for the allied health professionals in india we have uh, professionals lacking right from midwives to nurses to other paramedics radiographers technicians and so on and so forth so if we talk about the need for the skilled health workforce health is one of this industries that we all agree is one of the most dynamic ones skills are very very important it's usually life saving situations critical golden hours that we are talking about so the kind of people that they join the health sector it becomes really really important are we rightly invested in their education and training so to cater to these you know multiple issues the lack of opportunities for the youth at one end and the lack of trained healthcare staff on the other g has been trying to bridge this gap through multiple programs that we run skill creation is one of the pillars that we have uh, you could call it capacity building skill creation skill development the idea is we provide short term vocational courses of one year each that would help these you know college uh, school dropouts or people who are already working in the unorganized sector to join the healthcare resource pool the outcomes that we look to achieve through this one providing these kids with an opportunity to education training them per the employer expectations we have a huge network of uh, customers and industry partners who work with us and that uh, you know give us insights around what is needed in the industry what are some of the skill sets that are required on day 0 versus month 3 month 6 and so on and so forth thirdly it focuses on improving the earning potential and i'll talk about that later when we uh, discuss how we've integrated internships in this and finally the improved standard of living for these kids but something like this a uh, you know a comprehensive program with such huge deficit it takes a lot of partners to come together so the way we have approached it is we have healthcare sector skills council coming in which is a government of india and a, a chamber of industries initiative the idea is they will define the national operating standards and the quality framework for each job role that we introduce we currently have six job roles running namely x-ray technician radiography technician ot tech anesthesia technician diabetes educator and cardiac care technician so they help us with the clinical validity what skill sets what what learning objectives should be there in these programs then we have ngos and skilling partners these are people who have the outreach in the community but once we launched this programs we realized people who are really looking forward who really benefit who would really benefit from these are usually from a economically weaker background and cannot afford even the operating expenses and that's when we looped in tata trust which is one of the largest philanthropy organizations of the country they're funding these uh, students through soft loans once they get a job after 6 months they start paying back tata trust without any interest and then we have the healthcare industry partners who help us provide these internships and placements and there's a complete 360 degree loop where they tell us you know you need to add this more these are some of the topics that are upcoming and we would want you to add as for g we act as the nodal point connecting all these partners right from deciding which job roles bases the market assessment of what the demand supply gap looks like the content the pedagogy for same and then implementing these programs across the country moving on if i talk about the program structure as such all of these programs are one year long we have the students coming in in the classroom for four months where they go through the uh, there's a skill lab set up at every institute they go through the demo machines their theory and didactic lectures and so on and post that we have a one month observership where we place them with different hospitals and diagnostic centers uh, for them to you know shadow the senior technicians and go about how does it look like in a clinical setup then we have a six month internship we try and assure that it is a paid internship they get some stipend the idea is even if they're getting some 5000 indian rupees it helps them stay motivated for the program and 
they earn while they learn, as Shay mentioned. And finally, we have the assessment, a third party assessment done by Healthcare Sector Skill Council, and they certify the pass rate. So if you look at it, 60% of the course delivery is through these observerships and internships. The way we've seen it benefiting the students is when they join the job, and in most cases, the same facility that provides them internship absorbs these candidates and offers them final placements. They get an exposure to the clinical setup. As I mentioned, the healthcare sector, you, you, do, you need to be good enough on your job on day one. So these internships help them provide that exposure. They get the mentoring from the senior technicians and doctors and clinicians as to what is required of them as they join the workforce. They have a higher chance of employability. We've seen at most locations, the organization where they do their internships ends up offering a job. And then they start earning in four months time. The idea that these kids come from uh, these backgrounds is after four months, they start earning small. They get some stipend and that keeps them going for the rest of the year while you know they get that integrated into the healthcare system for lack of a better word. From the employer's standpoint, what we've seen, and we have now uh, with two years and three years into operation, we've seen that a lot of our uh, hospitals and employer networks, they come back and ask us, can you help me with this job role? Can you help me with that? They have more personnel at their department at a marginal cost during internships. They're paying a very small stipend, but you know, towards month three or four, these kids are as good as their regular hires. They get to evaluate their potential hires. It's a low risk strategy to evaluate skills. And then they have they're spending, and we did a study around this, they're spending very comparatively lesser time to educate these uh, these new joinees than they would have done with a, somebody who comes and joins on day one. So internships helps in that sense as well. And then as you know, they start with them young, there's a lower risk of attrition, which is pretty high when it comes to paramedical staff in India. So moving on, this is the progress that we have so far. We have 42 healthcare institutes across 19 states of India. We've run 86 batches to date. We work through 12 implementation partners and we have coverage from as low as tier three, tier four towns in the country. We have 2,400 plus enrolled participant across these six programs now. And something that we are really proud of, 50% of our participants are female. The pass percentage from HSSE stands at around 97% with the job placement of 95%. The average salary these kids get is 12,000 Indian rupees, which is fairly higher than the blue collar job they would have gotten uh, doing a welding or a fitting course. And then the highest salary one of our students has received is 40,000 Indian rupees. So we have, you see a couple of testimonials uh, on the slide. We have a lot of them now, and what's really you know keeps us going as a team is the change that we are making, not just to these students, but to the families, the healthcare ecosystem, and the patients at large, the health outcomes that we have. So that, that's all from our side. Happy to get any questions. Thank you for your time again. Hello, uh, this is Tyra Tudor from ADECO, and I am honored to join you today to talk about ADECO's involvement with work-based learnings. With the ADECO Group Global Headquarters in Zurich, Switzerland, and our CEO, Alain de Haas, being chairman of GAN, we are especially interested in growing the number of apprenticeships around the globe, and I have the privilege to support this mission in America. So what are work-based learnings from a U.S. standpoint and why the emphasis on apprenticeships? For us, a work-based learning is any opportunity to earn while you learn. And I've included some examples here, job shadowing, co-ops, externships, internships, apprenticeships, and registered apprenticeships. And we have an emphasis on apprenticeships because 
one, our Swiss roots, where apprenticeships are extremely effective, and two, because apprenticeships provide the most sophisticated work-based learning program, a prescription, if you will, that shows the exact path that an apprentice will take. And this is a slide that I borrowed from the Department of Labor Employment and Training Administration that is a visual to illustrate why we believe apprenticeships are an effective model for learning. Not only are you getting paid during the entire apprenticeship, but the apprenticeship provides a faster way to learn the job with real hands-on experiences from the very beginning. You may recall uh, from the first slide that I talked about apprenticeships and registered apprenticeships. And I, I just wanted to explain that for a minute for, for anyone that might not be familiar. In the US, we have registered apprenticeships where the program is officially registered with our Department of Labor. And we would consider a registered apprenticeship to be the, the gold standard, where we, but we do support all levels of apprenticeships even those that aren't registered, as well as all work-based learnings, as long as there's earning and learning combined. Um, for those that aren't familiar, I put a few bullets on here just to, to make sure you understood the Registered Apprenticeship Program in the U.S., which has been around for over 100 years. And the majority of the programs in the past have been focused on trades and union-backed industries. And it's a government federal Department of Labor program, which means sometimes employers, if you're in multiple states, you may have requirements at the state level as well. Um, it's perceived to be bureaucratic and costly, and there is upfront paperwork. There is a formal process. You do um, have your program subject to audit by the DOL. Um, but I'm proud to say that we have a task force being led by our Secretary of Labor that's underway right now to change some of the perceptions as well as the realities to ensure that we are growing apprenticeships in America. And um, I've seen the task force uh, firsthand. A lot of work is getting done, and it's helping catapult the momentum that I've seen over the last couple of years as we've been focused on this topic. There are non-traditional industries that are starting to register apprenticeships. Uh, banking, insurance, IT um, are some examples there. And at ADECO, we now have a registered apprenticeship program in the state of Kentucky, and I'm in the process of registering that program nationally. And I can tell you firsthand that the paperwork and process was not as bad as, uh, as some um, had said. And I believe that it's going to become even easier as the task force is focused on making the process easier and more accessible to non-traditional uh, businesses. Since we've been devoted to this work-based learning movement in America for um, almost two years, the conversation has, has changed a lot. And I, I think there's two drivers that are causing more companies, parents, policymakers, educators, to focus on work-based learnings. First, our unemployment rate in the U.S. is 4.1, is very low, and in, our businesses are struggling to find well-trained and reliable employees. And secondly, we are seeing flaws in what we've been advising our kids for, for many years, which is if you go to college, you will get a good paying job. So, so let me cover this college topic first. While we, we support the college track, we want to change the conversation because college isn't for everyone. For example, we need to make sure you know that a four-year degree right after high school is not the only option. They need to know there are good career pathways where the needed experience is learned on the job and apprenticeships provide the opportunity to gain certificates and stackable credentials and sometimes even college credit, which then can give them a head start to start a college degree at a later time. In Zurich, only 30% of students go straight to college. Many others take an apprenticeship track where they have been considering their track since the third grade. Contrast that in America, we have 70% of kids going straight to college but one-third of them drop out, and many finish with debt they can't pay back. 
The last point I'll make on this, many good paying jobs don't require a four-year degree. And I'm encouraged that I hear more and more conversations about other choices for our youth, as well as reskilling and retraining opportunities for people of all ages. Now, let me go back to the unemployment which is 4.1% in America, which is a very low rate, but that does equate to 7 million people. At the same time, we have 6 million unfilled jobs. And we all fill this, and the prediction is even worse that the skills gap will grow. With automation and technology, it certainly will require more skills, and we do believe that the skills gap is, is, is just going to get worse if we don't do something now. And there's a few reasons I've listed on this slide um, that, that people talk about contributing to this in America. One, we don't have enough training. Students exit school without the needed skills. Expectations are too high. Technology and automation are requiring new skills. Some jobs aren't paying enough. And all of this is contributing to a shortage of skilled talent. So what can, we, what can we do about it? We believe that businesses need to take on more of the role as a producer of talent and not just a consumer of talent. And with that, I'll share some personal ADECO examples of how we've tried to do just that. We put out an official pledge to say that we would facilitate 10,000 work-based learnings by 2020. We are working with federal, state, and local officials to adopt policies and practices to promote work-based learnings, and we're facilitating collaboration, really with anyone that will listen, um, but primarily with policymakers, business leaders, nonprofits, educators, trying to push this work-based learning model. Our role has really been to change the voice, to promote change. And we've done that by sharing experiences and best practices. We've developed new and tailored programs, which I'll talk about. We're bringing the right partners to the table to collaborate and, and simply changing the conversation, which we believe is most important. At ADECO, this is a priority under the corporate social responsibility, but it's because it's a way to give back to the community and our nation, but we strongly believe it's an effective HR strategy. It's, it's a proven way to increase the talent pipeline and should be an HR strategy in the talent acquisition department. Businesses need more skilled talent, and many unemployed Americans and graduates need the skills to do the job, and we want to be a leader in solving this problem. A few things that we've done specifically at ADECO in partnership with um, governments and educators. Um, I would say our best program, the one I'm most proud of, is our YES programs, which are in Kentucky and Ohio now. And it's focused on high school students. And often we're the employer of record here, and we're giving high schoolers an opportunity to earn and learn before they graduate from college. I'm sorry, before they go on to college or in many cases don't go to college because they have the experience to move up in businesses through the experiences they've learned uh, while in high school. The second example um, are solutions that we've tailored with clients. So one at a time, we'll get with a client, a local education partner, and we'll come up with a solution for a client to get more talent in the door. And then partnerships which we've seen with nonprofits, educators, government, um, anyone that needs help in trying to figure out how to do work-based learnings in their local market, um, we're there to help. And one example I would like to share uh, that is more recent than when I prepared these slides is an acquisition that the ADECO group made and announced last week with General Assembly, which is a pioneer in education and career transformation. <laughs> General Assembly helps retrain and reskill through workshops, courses, and classes. And we're very proud to have General Assembly in the family of the ADECO group. And we look forward to being able to offer an entirely new solution operating at the intersection of education and employment. 
Let me finish with a quote that our global CEO, Alain de Haas, recently shared. This is a quote from The Economist. Even though technology may not destroy jobs in aggregate, it does force change upon many people. A college degree at the start of a working career does not answer the need for the continuous acquisition of new clients. To remain competitive and to give low and high skilled workers alike the best chance of success, economies need to offer training and career focused education throughout people's working lives. Thank you, and I hope you'll join us in changing the conversation. Thank you so much, Tyra. That was a really inspirational presentation. Um, so glad your voice is here on the webinar today. Uh, we do have a number of questions in the chat box, and so um, why don't we just go ahead and get started. I know there was a question about um, skills that can be learned um, in an apprenticeship that could be uh, possibly taken to other um, future jobs. And Tyra, you mentioned this term stackable credentials. I wonder if anybody, um, any of the speakers would like to talk about transferable skills or stackable credentials. It's Tyra. I can I can share. So, um, with apprenticeships, and um, certainly with apprenticeships, and a gold standard with any work-based learning would be that the student, the person learning, would have something that could allow them to move up the track, either with their current employer or maybe going outside of that employer to a new employer, where they've learned a new skill that allows them to elevate themselves. And so it's important that we give them credentials that the industry um, accepts and that other businesses will accept so that it starts to look a little bit like what a four-year degree has served um, in America. And, and sometimes that's the form of a certificate, um, and sometimes it's a stackable um, certification. Great, thank you. Uh, Neha, would you like to say anything about transferable skills or stackable credentials? In terms of transferable skills in healthcare, while you can, you know, from a frontliner standpoint, you do have some skills that can be used, but it will still restrict it to the healthcare industry. Sorry, this is. Great. Um, I know I also saw another question around the challenges of setting up work-based work learning um, programs. And uh, actually, from my own experience, I know that there have been um, a lot of countries that want to use the German and the Swiss model uh, for apprenticeships, but have trouble implementing that. So uh, I wonder, Shay, if you might want to talk a bit about taking models from other countries and applying them, um, as well as uh, some of the challenges uh, that are around in terms of setting up work-based learning programs. OK, so I think one of the first areas where we find when we go into a country, particularly um, in countries that don't have historically a sort of apprenticeship kind of program or only in certain industries such as construction or, or blue collar jobs. Unfortunately, the legislation is often not very positive towards apprenticeships. And, and there's a reason for this. And many places, internships, traineeships, apprenticeships were often looked at as sometimes cheap labor. And so sometimes there was a huge push by many of the social partners and others to make the rules extremely strict. And the problem is that that does not, in hasn't, helped 
employers in setting up apprenticeship programs. And so, for instance, in Turkey and um, in France, we have GAN national networks. In Turkey, we've already changed the legislation. And so there are incentives for co companies to set up apprenticeships. And the government is paying for some of the social security benefits of these apprentices. In France, there's a whole problem about your employee count, your taxation, etc. And they're really looking at changing both some of the legislation to make it easier for employers, making it what we might call employer friendly, but also trying to work around the stigma. The other thing is finding the right partners. When we do a GAN national network, we always make sure we have the government, the social partners, the unions if relevant, um, the education, educational institutions, and that could be community colleges, universities, vocational training institutions, getting them all around the table and really seeing Apprenticeships are one of the oldest public-private partnerships. It doesn't work with just one group. It needs to be having all. There is a problem around the return on investment, and I can go into that later, but convincing employers that there is a return on investment is a huge challenge. Many of them don't see it. They are training a lot of young people. They have a lot of training programs, but somehow they're not, in a lot of countries, willing to go down and do the apprenticeship-type program. Parents and school counselors are very important in trying to change that sort of stigma and change the image of apprenticeships. But when you were saying probably um, why, um, what are some of the challenges that we see, we see really getting the word out there because so many people really do not know anything about apprenticeships. And we're really surprised at this and we really feel that the more we get the word out there, the more we get the partners around the table, the better it is. Now on the return on investment, it's the retention, the loyalty, the also using the apprenticeship as sort of a recruitment tool, and then also making sure that these young people get to know the com company, like the company, and end up sort of staying within that company. The maturity and those core skills are something that you get through these apprenticeships. Great, very helpful. Um, I, I don't know, Tyra or Neha, if you want to say anything about this issue of return on investment, particularly from the employer perspective. You know, in, um, Hi, in the places where we've seen the most momentum, clients are not able to find the talent that they need. And so they need new tools in the toolbox to get talent. And we do have um, presentations that we share to show that retention is better whenever you train um, yourself. And we also produce return on investment uh, statistics. Um, it, it is hard, but um, you can, with just the retention number, show that there is a return if you can keep um, employees longer. and. Um, uh, Barrett, you may have seen, is quoted in the chat box, um, who runs our program in Kentucky. And his study with the businesses that are using our YES program there, that they are getting a return for every dollar. They're getting, you know, 147 back. Um, so we certainly believe in it. And um, if, if anyone needs help trying to calculate a return on investment or see how we calculated it, they're welcome to reach out um, to, to me. I'll loop and bear it, and we'll see what we can do to help with that. Super, thank you. That, yeah, that was another one of the questions, which is how do you measure uh, the benefits of apprenticeships? Uh, Neha, I don't know if you want to add anything to the return on investment or measurement discussion. So on the return on investment side, I think, as she mentioned, one is around regulation. Do, do you, you know, when we go to these employers to offer these kids internship in the first place, sometimes they're not too open to the idea and they do consider, okay, the gap is so huge in the healthcare industry that they're okay to take them on, but the propensity to pay them these stipends and salaries is really low. They do look at it as availability of cheap labor. So that's something that the government regulations and the uh, social society needs to uh, worry about. 
and you know take care of that but what what we've seen is if you can establish enough proof points and that has happened with some of our employers they do see the value and then it becomes a really easy sell for lack of a better word that then it becomes really easy we see a lot of organizations coming back to us and this time a lot more you know they are they're ready to hire these kids and get going so i think you need to establish some of those proof points right great thank you for that uh there's another question here about uh uh working uh with young people who have education gaps maybe who have dropped out of school um are displaced uh how how do you feel um how are you able to work with young people who might have that kind of a education gap or maybe some other um issue in their background that makes it difficult for them to kind of go from one uh education step to the next um or an apprenticeship for example Well, this is Shay. Um I think that's a really good question. Um we are seeing more and more of what we're calling pre-apprenticeship programs. And the question sort of uh they're asking do they have the basic math or um uh language skills etc. A really good example of this is in Switzerland they're looking at this but they also have it in Germany and some other countries is pre-apprenticeship programs for refugees who come into a country and might not have the language skills and other skills but they are they would like to work in certain industries etc so these pre-apprenticeship programs really try to tackle some of those basic skills that one would normally acquire when they're in high school um but at the same time uh, i would say that apprenticeships a lot of people tend to think of them as for 16 year olds or maybe 17 18 years old in the us the average age of an apprentice is 26 years old because many of them have gone to high school gone to university probably dropped out they in fact have college debt which is a, a problem on top of that and then they go back and then they move into an apprenticeship type program so we're seeing that these apprenticeship models are being used for pre-apprenticeships part time and also for re-education of people who are probably lost not in the labor market or they lost their job they need new skills for a new job but there are some that feel if you're in a very very technical industry and i've seen um and interviewed some of these apprentices in the robotics area etc they do an apprenticeship but those kids are probably going to go on to a university degree after their apprenticeship these are highly technically uh, skilled sort of jobs but for some of these basic jobs we're finding that you don't need to have extremely high levels of mathematics and language skills but you need some really basic service orientation um skills you need to know add subtract averages and there's some very interesting programs in South Africa a school called Harambe where they take a lot of disadvantaged youth and they are training them on basic skills and they're getting jobs with employers because they have the social skills but some of those basic skills that they maybe didn't have when they first went into the program so again um it depends on the industry it depends on the company it depends um uh very much on the on the local circumstances but i think there's a lot that's being done to teach those basic skills before you go into an apprenticeship great very very helpful information um another kind of related question was around working with youth with disabilities uh i don't know if uh, tyra or neha you want to say anything about maybe working with youth who have had those educational gaps and or maybe who um also have special needs or disabilities um i we so have an example um but you go ahead. i can do me to go first okay um in ohio um we partnered with a nonprofit who was helping um some youth with um some um 
different challenges and we found local businesses who were interested in having an outreach with the same mission and we came together and placed uh, 15 students with special needs at businesses. In those um, situations, it's, it's, we found that having a nonprofit at the table who is uh, working on that mission may make that um, more doable. Neha, did you want to add anything? Right. So uh, for us, for different programs, uh, we do encourage people with special needs. But uh, given that it's the healthcare, that varies course to course. For example, for a critical care technician, it might not, you know, the uh, entry criteria might be a little bit stringent as for special needs when compared to a diabetes educator. And that's only from, uh, you know, a perspective of uh, what the job description entails. As for providing uh, basic skills, each of the programs that we run has a module on life skills, if you will. These include computer literacy, soft skills, some amount of financial literacy and financial planning. So while we are training them to join the healthcare sector, the idea is they do have these basic life skills to get them going through their careers. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, finally, I think for, for our last question, uh, someone had asked about taking some of these uh, programs to scale. How, how do you best think about um, serving more and more youth, considering uh, the number of, of young people that are in need of employment? Uh, I don't know what um, any of you have thought about in terms of scale, uh, replication, those kinds of things. Maybe, Shay, you'd like to tackle that one uh, first. Okay, so um, I think uh, that it's a really good point because it's actually worrying to hear um, and there was, there's been some press around apprenticeships, particularly in the U.S., and you hear some of these big companies saying, oh, we have 25 apprentices or, you know, 50 apprentices, and you're thinking, oh, my goodness, and there are millions of youth unemployed. How are we going to bring this up? Um, I think um, getting the word out there is key. And, and this is, this is we think, and probably the people around the table know this very well, but a lot of people don't know about it. But also getting employers engaged and getting them to understand that this is an interesting pathway. And I do have to say, ADECO, in trying to work with companies, and, and we were just at Nestle, and they're working with their companies, etc. This is the way to go, to get some of the other employers engaged. But to get to scale, job growth is not going to be with multinationals. It is going to be with SMEs. And so we're seeing some very interesting things. When you're looking at the legislation, if you make it simple enough, and it's already set up and the work has been done, SMEs can more easily take on apprentices. But we're also seeing that a lot a lot of our large companies are now training people that are in their, what we might call their global supply chain. And so they're training young people on apprenticeships who will never work for them. That's how we'll get scale, particularly getting through to the SMEs. And I think that getting from 25 to 25,000 means you need a lot more partners around the table. And it may not be only apprenticeships, but if we can get them engaged in what I'm calling work readiness programs, I think we have a win-win situation there. Ooh. Excellent. Well, I just want to say I think this has been a really interesting uh, discussion, and I appreciate all of you joining us today, um, all of our speakers. Uh, it's a new topic for us to explore in a webinar, and I think it was very much worth the investment of time and resources, and I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion as well, all of our attendees. Um, I'll pass it over to Sarah to, to finish us off. Yeah. Thanks, Christy, and thanks to all of our speakers and to everybody who joined today's webinar. In just a few moments, we're going to direct everyone to an online survey, and it takes just two minutes. We'd really appreciate your completing the survey and giving us your feedback so that we can continue to create these types of learning events in the future. The webinar has been recorded, and it will be posted on youtheconomicopportunities.org, and you'll receive a link via email. 
If you found this webinar useful, so will others in your network. So we really encourage you to promote this webinar according to others. Thank you again to everybody, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.